All right, well, this morning, we're going to, as I've already told you, what we're looking at, we're looking at time with the Lord, and we're going to see that though it may begin with the Sabbath, it really is all of life, okay? I'll, I'll just sort of, uh, you know, uh, give, you, give you that, uh, that giveaway, so to speak. So, the passage I want to look at this morning, though, does deal with the primary reason why God gave us the Sabbath in the first place, and, and let me just... Um, uh, uh, you know, give you, um, uh, again, a little bit of a spoiler. God didn't command the Sabbath in order to ruin our lives or to make them more difficult because, drat, I can't do what I'd like to do on this day, right? But rather, He gave the day to us for that which is uh, most important to us, and that makes this day the greatest blessing. And He intends it as a blessing, and that's the way we need to look at it. But Let's just read this passage, and then we'll get into it. So Mark 2, verses 23 through 28. And it happened that he was passing through the grain fields on the Sabbath. And his disciples began to make their way along while picking the heads of grain. The Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you not read what David did? When he was in need and he and his companions became hungry, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priests. And he also gave it to those who were with him. Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. The law was never made to harm us. It was made to protect us. Okay? It was made to be a blessing to us. And that's what our Lord wants us uh, to understand. Now, I've already mentioned that last week we were looking at the scholastic movement. And again, it just, I, I think it's, it's, it's really a fascinating time in church history. And what came out of it, as we saw, remember that the Protestant churches had to answer the questions that were being raised by those who opposed them, and it came from several different quarters. And as their opponents pushed more and more on these differing issues, they had to dig deeper and deeper into the Scriptures, and it brought about <clears throat> not, not new knowledge, so to speak, or you know, additional knowledge, but it really it's a new depth of understanding of what God has already given to us in the Word of God, more than, you know, the, the church had experienced up to that point. Remember I said last week, you know, that the early confession of the Christian was Jesus is Lord, and how that expanded through the years, you know, as more and more challenges came to what, who Jesus is. You, you had to have a fuller confession. Well, as everything gets challenged, you know, uh, our understanding continues to grow more and more deeply so that we know exactly what it is that God has said. So that's what the scholastic movement was all about. We do have some of their writings in the library. I would commend them to you. Um, but it's not easy reading. Very, very um, deep reading. We have Turretin's Institutes of Elenctic Theology, which we saw last week was his polemic theology. Polemics being uh, his arguments for the truth against what they considered to be uh, false. Not necessarily heretical. Not everything is heretical if it doesn't agree with Scripture. If it strikes at the gospel, it is. But good Christians differ on issues, you know, that, um, that uh, may not be, you know, I mean, some of us may be wrong in certain areas, and certainly all of us are wrong in some areas, and if we knew where those errors were, we would correct them. But since we don't, we continue to hold to what we believe Bible, the Bible says, what God says in His Word. And that's the essence of what God wants us to do as believers. But, okay, the point is, Godfrey's going to point out this evening with this new understanding of Scripture, this, this great explosion of, of knowledge, came new challenges, okay? They had their theological ducks in a row, so to speak, but they realized that God's people were not necessarily doing what it is they should be doing. You know, they began to focus more on individual piety and to try to understand how to encourage believers in their faith and in obedience, or in other words, in Christ's likeness. And that's what Puritan piety is all about. The, the Puritan movement is seeking to make all of life holiness to the Lord. So that's why I want us to focus today 
uh, more broadly, perhaps, or maybe not, maybe not more broadly, but the, but the same, uh, to consider why it is that God saved us. We know there's, there's a variety of reasons, but sometimes we miss perhaps maybe one of the more important ones, and it's always good for us to reflect on God's purpose so we can make sure we're lined up with it in case we happen to have fallen off the path somewhere along the way. And the problem is we all of us have sin in our hearts that is moving us off the path. Again, just read Pilgrim's Progress and you'll get a good uh, picture of, of how that works. Now, I want to say at the beginning, God did save us for several reasons, not just one. Okay, he saved us because he loves us. That's one reason. He wanted us to be safe from, from the judgment that we would have to endure forever for our sins. God's love and his love, he reached down and saved us. So that's one reason. He saved us because he wanted to reveal his grace to us. He wanted to show his grace to the world uh, by giving us a gift that we do not deserve when we do, in fact, deserve the opposite. You know, God gave us eternal life but we deserve damnation. When he does that, we call that grace, you know? Mercy is not giving us what we deserve. It's not just not giving us hell, but he gives us heaven, which we don't deserve. That is grace. And he wanted to, again, reveal that grace. Well, experiencing that grace in our own lives, he wanted us to respond to him in worship, to thank him, to praise him, to love him, in return. Now, we owed him that anyway by virtue of the fact that he created us and gave us everything we have, but how much more now that he has saved us? He wanted that worship, that love for him to be expressed in service so that we would be his lights and his ambassadors to the world, you know, to bring others to him himself. But, and this is what we want to focus on today, he also saved us that he might give us as a reward to his son, okay, the reward for his work in saving us. And because he's giving us to Jesus to live with him forever in heaven, so that Jesus might be the firstborn among many brethren, again, this one family, we're all to share certain characteristics. God wants us to be like him to be his brethren in more than just name only, he wants us to share his nature and his character, to be holy, even as he is holy. And I know we may have different ideas of what holiness is, you know, not that we walk around sort of shining or there's like a cloud that's covering us, but rather that we love as he loves. Remember, holiness is really what the law of God expresses, but we do know that love is the fulfillment of the law so that we love him and our neighbor as he calls us to. Now, that's the reason why Jesus, when he ascends to heaven, sends his Holy Spirit. That's why he gives the Holy Spirit in the first place is to give us the power to be transformed into his image by giving us the desire, by putting that love in our hearts. That's why he gives us his word so that we would have a clear understanding of what that love actually is. You know, people have differing ideas of what it means to love somebody else. And we know the world's idea of love is something God hates. So there's only one true definition. God gives that in his word. That's why he gave it to us and why he gave us a perfect example of this love in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, it's good to have something visual in front of us that we can follow. Jesus loved his father with all his heart. When I say that, I'm talking about when he was on earth, he continues to do that in heaven. But what we have in the scriptures, we see Jesus loved his father, and so he walked with him constantly in communion and fellowship with him. He focused his whole mind and soul on giving the father honor, you know, by showing him that love, and gave all his time and all his strength to serve him. Now, let me ask you a question. If, if we are predestined to become conformed to the image of Christ, and that's the work that the Spirit of God is doing in our lives, then what does God desire of us? But the same thing, right? That's what He wants. This is what sanctification is all about. So today, we really are considering how we can become more like Him. 
You know, we, we know about the means of grace, and we're going to talk about something a little bit different, uh, although not entirely different. We're, we're familiar with this. But we know that the Father has given us everything we need. We know He's given us His Son. He's given us His Spirit. He's given us His Word, the means of grace, prayer, worship, fellowship. All these things are very, very important. But He's also given us something else that's very important, and that is time. Time in which to use these things, okay, in order to grow into the image of Christ. And we have to use them, and it takes time to use them. Sanctification, remember, is becoming more like Jesus, but it's a cooperative process. It's not one-sided like justification is one-sided. You know, in justification, Jesus does it all, and we receive all. It's purely a gift of His grace. But in sanctification, we are called to work out our own salvation, and I believe Paul means in Philippians 2.12, he's referring really to sanctification there, work out our salvation with fear and trembling because God is at work in us, both to do and to will of His good pleasure. So what is it exactly we're supposed to be doing? Well, like Jesus, we are to seek to be in constant communion with God. Which, which means, you know, we need to take time, okay, time. We need time with Him. So this morning, I want us to consider that God has given us time. He has given to us one day every week, the Sabbath, the Lord's Day, in which to spend time with Him, okay, to use these means of having communion with Him. Now, we're, we're going to go beyond that, but I want to at least start here. Okay, Jesus tells us in our passage the Sabbath was made for man, that God ordained it for our good, not to hurt us, but to help us. Now, we know there that Jesus is referring to the fourth commandment, and you know, that should give us a clue, first of all, that the Sabbath continues because it's a part of the Ten Commandments, which is the moral law of God, which never changes, which the Spirit of God is said to write on our hearts in the New Covenant, okay? Well, this commandment is stated for us in Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. And this is what Jesus is referring to when he says, the Sabbath was made for man. God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor, work, and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant, or your cattle, or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now, I want us to notice a couple of things from this command. First of all, God calls us to keep the Sabbath day holy. And what that means is, to set it apart to God. You know, holiness means to be set apart in some way. If it's referring to, uh, you know, objects, they are to be set apart to God. If it's referring to us, we are to be set apart to God. In this case, it's referring to a day. That day is to be set apart to God. And this day is to be set apart to Him to rest so that we might worship Him and that we might spend time with His people. Now, To do that, of course, we have to make sure we clear it from all the other obligations of the week. We need to set the work aside that He's given us the other six days in which to do that work. Six days you shall work. It's been pointed out that there's a commandment within this commandment to work, to work for six days, right? But within that time frame of the six days, we are to do all of our work. And on this day, we are to rest. And by the way, I think you know that's what Sabbath means. The word means rest, okay? We are not to work on this day. We're to rest. And we're also, by implication, you know, um, not to make others work, okay? We're not supposed to be making them work or do, you know, as we're going to see, unnecessary work so that they can rest and they can keep this day holy as well, even if they're not believers, right? This is something they should do. 
because this is what God commands. And you know, on the day of judgment, when Jesus said he's going to bring every single sin an unbeliever has ever done, you know, every idle word, thought, every breaking of the Sabbath, okay, that's all going to be brought against them on that day. Of course, unless they turn to Christ and, and Christ has cleansed all that away. But they're going to be held accountable for what's right and what's wrong. And this is one of the things that God calls them uh, to do. So we don't work. We don't make them work. Now, that's, those are the nuts and bolts of the commandment. Okay? But again, Jesus' point is this. He didn't give us this day to make our lives harder, but to, make, uh, but to be a blessing to us. And in a certain sense, as we saw, to all mankind, because we all need rest. Okay? Now, in the context, Jesus said this to defend his disciples against the Pharisees who were accusing the disciples of breaking the Sabbath because they were picking grain on God's holy day. And by the way, they were picking it out of the field that didn't belong to them, but they still were not sinning because God had given the sojourner the right to glean in the field if they needed to do so. I mean, they couldn't go harvest their neighbor's field, but they could, uh, they could take what they needed. Okay? But the point is, they were doing it on the Sabbath. They were doing some work, and so the Pharisees were calling them on it. Now, Jesus here is telling the Pharisees, by defending his disciples, that there are certain exceptions to this law. In the same way, he says that it was lawful only for the priest to eat the consecrated bread, and yet David and his men, when they ate it, were not guilty Okay, and they did it to preserve their lives. There was a reason they ate it. They didn't just break into the temple and steal the bread, but they, they needed it okay, to preserve their lives in the same way the disciples could break this commandment and do this work since they were traveling and needed food to preserve their lives. Okay, in other words, works of necessity are exceptions to the commandment not to work. We may do the things that are necessary to protect our lives on this day. God does not mean this day to harm us. If we break our leg, you know, on this day, we don't wait until Monday to go to the doctor. Or if we have a heart attack, you know, we don't just not call the ambulance until tomorrow because we're afraid we're going to make somebody work. But we do what is necessary to protect our lives. We, we seek out that medical attention or the food if we happen to be traveling. And we can also do what's necessary to preserve other people's lives. You know, that's called works of mercy. That's why when doctors and nurses and EMTs and paramedics and firemen and police officers are working on this day, they're not breaking the Sabbath. Jesus reminds us again why God established the day in the first place. It was for us, okay, for our good. Now, by making these exceptions, you need to remember he's not saying, well, whatever I think is good for me, then I can just do it. No, because he has given us to stay for our ultimate good, what we really need. By commanding us to take the day off, and by the way, in taking the day off from work, we have other passages of Scripture that also remind us that we're not to then just plunge into recreations, you know. It's not a day to embrace the world and and just, you know, get consumed by things that really make no difference. He's giving us this time for a specific reason. It is that which is most important for us, and that is to cultivate our communion with Him through worship, because it's this communion with Him. And by the way, I'm not talking about this. This is part of it. But what we're doing right now, okay, worshiping the Lord, we're in His Word, we're talking about His Word, we're thinking about His Word, and it, we're having communion with the Lord Jesus Christ. We're having communion with God. This is what makes us more like Jesus. We're going to be reminded of that a little bit more this evening as well. Jesus walked with the Father in constant communion, as we noted before. And the more time we spend with God, the more time we are going to become like Him and Likewise, the less time we spend with Him, the less we're going to be like Him. That is a universal truth. It's an axiom. That, that's just the way it is. So if you want to be more like Him, if we want to be more like Him, we, we definitely need to spend more time with Him. Now, 
This is why God created the Sabbath from the very beginning. You know, at the end of the creation week, we read in Genesis 2, verses 2 and 3, by the seventh day, God completed his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his works which God had created and made. Now, it's been argued, and I think it's true, especially from what we read earlier in Exodus 20, that when God rested on this day and blessed this day, he didn't bless it for himself. He blessed it for the man that he had made, and even for his creatures. We just read in the commandment, even the creatures are supposed to rest on this day. So the reason why we are to keep a Sabbath, as, we're, as we read in Exodus 20, is because God worked six days and rested on the seventh, therefore we are to do the same thing. Why did God take six days to create something he could have spoken into existence instantly? That's what the Puritans wondered when they, you know, uh, well, when they were arguing actually against Augustine, because that was the conclusion Augustine came to. God could have done it instantly, and so he did it instantly. Well, why does he explain it in six days? Well, that's because he was explaining it to the angels. Well, couldn't the angels understand that he did it instantly? Well, that doesn't make any sense. Why did God take six days? He did it because he was setting for us a pattern. That's the only reason. He didn't need six days to do it. God is infinite in power. He speaks and it happens, right? Could have done it in an instant. But he did it this way to give us this pattern. And why did he rest? Well, he was done. But he blessed the day for us. He made it for the man and his wife that he had just created primarily, but again, for all the creatures. Now, we may tend to think that Adam and Eve just kind of hung out in the garden, you know, just sort of strolled around all day and had nothing better to do. They were just, I don't know, spending time with God, you know, hanging out with him. But that really wasn't the case. Do you know that when God made Adam and Eve, he put them in the garden specifically to cultivate it? They were farmers, okay? So it was their task to work the soil in order to produce fruit. You know, in, in Genesis, it talks about this problem. There was, there was no cultivated grain and there weren't any cultivated trees and it's because there was no rain and there was no man to cultivate. Well, God created the man to cultivate, okay? That was one of the things that he had to do. But the other thing he had to do was to keep the garden. And that means to guard it. That's what the word means in Hebrew, to guard this sanctuary of God from intruders that might come into it. Well, we might ask, well, who possibly could come into the garden and invade it? Well, there was somebody who did, and that was Satan. And the rest of it is history, right? Our downfall. They didn't repel the intruder. They didn't guard the sanctuary. They let him in and let him stay and listen to him. And that's something that we're taught also not to do. But because they had this work, they needed a day off so that they could rest from this work and have time to cultivate their communion with God. Okay? They needed this day. Perfect humanity needed this day. Now, they also needed it after the fall. You know, when the fall took place, it didn't destroy that day. They needed it more than ever. The first thing that we actually read about after the fall, after Cain and Abel were born and they, they grew up, was that they were worshiping God at the end of the week. They were worshiping Him on the seventh day. They were bringing sacrifices to Him. That's what it means in, in the course of time or at the end of days. It's talking about the end of the cycle of days in a week. God was graciously maintaining his relationship with them, and so he gave them this day to nurture that relationship. He also gave it to his old covenant people for the same reason. As we read earlier, it was engraved on those tablets of stone with the rest of the commandments. And the question we need to ask is this, don't we also need this day of rest and worship since we too are in a relationship with him through faith in Christ and we too have to work, you know, during the week, we need time. We need time. So it shouldn't surprise us that Jesus spoke more about this commandment than any of the others. And by the way, you know, when people that, um, well-meaning Christians who want to reject the Sabbath, 
uh, or believe that, they, not that they want to reject it, but they believe it's past, and they, they look at some of the passage where Paul says, you know, one person regards one day above another and so forth, and don't realize that there were other days that were part of the ceremonial law that were also called Sabbaths that were done away with with the ceremonial law. Okay, so they, they see this um, and they don't realize that that's really what this is uh, referring to. They want to say that when Jesus taught about it, that he was really talking to the Jews and not to his church. But then we have to realize at the end of Matthew's gospel, when he sends them out to make disciples of the entire world, he says to them, teach them to observe all that I commanded you. Okay? Teach these Gentile disciples who are part of the new covenant church, teach them everything that I taught you and keep every command that I have commanded you. Well, Jesus taught on the Sabbath and he told them, he, he upheld the Sabbath, right? I mean, he talked about it in our passage, the Sabbath was made for man. Jesus kept the Sabbath, he worshiped on the Sabbath, he preached on the Sabbath, he healed on the Sabbath. He was constantly correcting the Pharisees on what may or may not be done on the Sabbath, and he even calls himself the Lord of the Sabbath. And he says that as the God-man, as the head of the new covenant. And I already pointed out, when speaking of the destruction of the temple that was going to take place in 70 AD, which was after his death and his resurrection, he told his disciples that they should pray that that would not happen on the Sabbath day. Okay? He was telling them, that God was still giving them that day, not surprisingly, even after he had completed his work. In the Old Covenant, as it's looking forward to the New Covenant, it talks about how those who keep this day would be delighting in the Lord. You know, how can you know that you delight in him? Well, when he gives you a day to spend with him, you spend it with him, okay? That this would be a day of rejoicing, right? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And he said that those who would keep this day, again, from the old covenant looking into the new covenant, that they would be blessed. God was going to write this law also on our hearts in the new covenant as well as the other nine. And I've already told you, the author to the Hebrews tells us that the Sabbath continues because of the work of Christ, right? Because he has entered into his rest. He has opened the door for us to be able to enter it. Really, the only thing that's changed about the Sabbath is the day. In the Old Covenant, the Sabbath, uh, Saturday was kept on, this, you know, Sabbath was kept on Saturday in order to commemorate God's rest at the end of the creation week. Okay, that part of it's clear. In the new covenant, though, according to the author to the Hebrews and according to the example we have of the early church worshiping on the first day of the week, we are to keep it on that first day of the week because we are commemorating the completion of the new creation that Christ brought. That's really what the author to the Hebrews is telling us when he says there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God because Christ has entered into his rest and has rested from his works as God did from his in the work of the first creation, which was destroyed by sin. So God continues to give us this day. He gives it to us because we need it. He made the Sabbath for us. Not, it's not supposed to be working against us, but for us. But that for us is so that we would have communion with Him. Communion takes time. And on this day, we can, you know, it's not, you know, I'm looking for a reason to put all this stuff away so I can focus on God. God says, I'll, I'll solve the problem for you. I'll just give you a command to do this. So you, you have to set these other things aside so you can feel comfortable with doing that. You can, you can comfortably say, I don't have to worry about this because God has told me this is what I need to do so that I can spend time with Him. That is very, very important. We're going to hear a little bit more about that this evening, how the breakdown of the Sabbath is perhaps one of the main reasons why the church is in the situation that she is in today because even the churches that, that do meet only meet for maybe an hour, but then the rest of the day is spent in the world, and they don't come back even for evening 
service to worship the Lord, so they hear less, they learn less, they spend less time with God, they're sanctified less, and they become more like the world than they are like Christ. You can't just spend an hour with them every week and expect to be like Christ. And that really brings us to the second point, that we really need to see the Sabbath as the, the if I'm going to put it, put it this way, a temporal starting point for this communion to sort of line, line our sights up, so to speak, to make sure we're going in the right direction at the beginning of the week. And we need to keep this fellowship up with God throughout the week. Let me remind you of a couple of passages of Scripture that tell us that that really is what life is all about. And I've already given you an argument from the fact that Christ walked in communion with the Father and fellowship with Him. And we are predestined to become conformed to His image. That's why He's given us His Spirit and His Word so we can become like Christ. We can do the same thing. But we're actually commanded to do this. In Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, Paul writes this, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but re be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect, loving and holy, like Christ, okay? What Paul is saying here is that worship is not just for the Sabbath. All of life is to be worshiped to the Lord. Paul also writes in, to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Our worship is to descend even to the, the very mundane things of life. Everything we do is to be worshiped to the Lord. And we do that, of course, by doing it according to his will and out of love for him. And again, there's liberty in, in certain areas. I mean, but we got to make sure that you know, that we're only allowing ourselves those things we actually have liberty to do. If we don't have faith to do it, we shouldn't do it. Now, we need to do, have you ever heard of the book, um, Practicing the Presence of God by Brother Lawrence? I guess he was a monk. I don't know if he lived in the medieval time or whatever, but the theme of the book is that we need to walk through the day with God, be aware of his presence, okay? And talk to him and let him talk to you through the scriptures. That's the way we need to, to live. Well, I think that's good advice. And I think if we add that to um, what Henry Scudder writes in his book, The Life of God and the Soul of Man. Oh, here's another book for the ladies perhaps to, uh, to study. But a, a book I think that we would all probably enjoy. And here's the reason why you should enjoy it. George Whitfield, when he read the book, realized he wasn't converted. <laughs> it brought him to Christ, Okay. So, a very important book, The Life of God and the Soul of Man by Henry Scudder. But this is what Scudder suggests that we do, and just a couple of suggestions, okay? That when we wake up in the morning, the first thing we should think about as we rise from our beds is the day that when we rise from our graves to stand before God in the last judgment. Hey, wouldn't that be maybe a, I mean, think about that, that's a pretty heavy thought to start the day with, but... If you start every day thinking that someday I'm going to have to give an account to God and I use my rising up out of bed as, as that, you know, sort of cue to remind me, th then I'm reminded every morning, right? And then when we go to bed at night, he said we should think about the last time. Every time we lay down, we should think about the last time that we lay down, the day when we leave this world and we go to be with our Lord. And in light of these two events, we should live throughout the day in communion with God, walking with God, practicing His presence, and showing Him how much we love Him. So how do we do that? Well, we should spend time, I think, in the morning is a good time. You know, not just when you rise, don't just think about that, but spend time with Him and read and pray and ask for His blessing on the day, at night, Seek his blessing for, for rest and for the next day. During the course of the day, look at every situation that, that you have to face. We should look at every situation we have to face in the way that Jesus would look at it, right? And make choices, the choices he would make in order to glorify his Father. Now, how do we know what Jesus would choose? Well, 
we need to be in His Word, don't we? We need to be constantly in His Word, letting it saturate our thinking so that the Spirit of God is constantly raising Scripture in our mind. That's what it really means to walk according to the Spirit. The Spirit is giving us a desire to do the right thing, and the right thing is what the Word of God says. So we need to know what that is so we can do it when the Spirit of God calls us to do it. So if we really want to be more like Jesus, we need to spend more time in communion with the Father. Okay, we need to consecrate our lives to Him so that by doing, you know, really by His will, I should say, becoming our food as it was Christ, uh, we will learn to live like Christ. You know, Jesus only did those things that glorified the Father. But let me just, again, back up for a minute and say this. It begins with the Sabbath. I, I've said in the past that the Sabbath day is really a, kind of like a spiritual thermometer. If, if we really believe the Bible teaches the Sabbath is for the Lord and we should rest and not work, we should spend this day with each other and spend this day with Him, and we don't do it, okay, what does that say about us? If we do do it and we, we look forward to it, what does that say about us? Well, it's kind of like a spiritual thermometer, isn't it? It kind of shows us where we're at spiritually. Well, that's why we need the Sabbath for one thing, but again, it begins here, and if we are able to keep the Sabbath, if, we're, if we enjoy spending the day with Him, then you know, we need to remember that um, we can do the same thing every day, although we do have to work the other six days. But we can still walk with God during those times. We may not be able to sit down and read our Ligonier books as we're going to be encouraged to do this evening by uh, Dr. Godfrey, but we can still serve the Lord. I mean, this really is, is sort of like char recharging our batteries, isn't it? So that we can go out and serve the Lord the rest of the week. And so let's remember why the Lord gave us this day. You know, not to be a burden, not to hurt us, but rather to be a blessing. And let's purpose in our hearts to spend it with Him. It will really go a long ways in helping us become more like Christ, which is our ultimate goal as Christians. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to help us do this.